Hello, everyone. I'm Cheryl DuPont, and it is my pleasure today to host a roundtable discussion with some of our most distinguished leaders in the field of children and youth choirs. I have known these wonderful friends and colleagues for over 20 years, and I invited them because of their varied and interesting backgrounds and their fine careers as artists, teachers. I'm very grateful to all of them for spending time with us. Before we begin, I would like to share a little information about each of them. I am introducing them in alphabetical order. Bob Chilcott is a world-renowned British composer and choral director. He keeps a busy schedule writing music and traveling throughout the world to conduct festivals and workshops. Bob is also teaching part-time this year at a girls' school not far from Oxford, England. Emily Ellsworth is currently serving as a visiting choral conductor at Luther College, conducting two 80-voice choirs, one SFAA and one SATV. For 22 years, she brought her passion for young people of all ages to her role as artistic director of the Anima Glen Ellen Children's Course outside of Chicago. Henry Leck is a professor emeritus in choral music at Butler University. He is also the founder and conductor laureate of the Indianapolis Children's Choir, one of the largest and most successful children's choir programs in the United States. He also currently serves as the music director of the choral area of Music for All, which brings over 400 secondary choral students together with the National Choir Festivals held in Indianapolis annually. Deborah Mello is founder and artistic director of the Children's Chorus of Sussex County, New Jersey. This fall is their 30th season. In addition to CCSC, Debbie conducts the Junior Choir at Christ Episcopal Church and is a choral music professor at Montclair State University in New Jersey. For many years, Debbie was a public school teacher teaching grades K through 12. We're delighted to have these wonderful people with us today. I have several questions that I'm going to ask everyone, and I'm going to ask them uh, in alphabetical order again, starting with different people each time. So my first question, I know from my own experience that those who work with young choirs have a variety of paths to that specialty and often teach other levels, play instruments, and have performing careers before and in addition to conducting children and youth choirs. Please tell us about your path. And Bob, would you begin for us, please? Well, thank you. It's very, very nice to uh, speak to you from such a long way away, and I hope you're all in good shape. Um, my path was to the children's choir work. I started my life as a performing musician, as a singer. I um, just before I left the King's Singers, I was asked by Jean Asperus Bartle to write some pieces for the Toronto Children's Chorus, and I thought, children's chorus, what's that, you know? And I went up to Toronto to hear my pieces, and I was completely blown away. I thought, gosh, this is, this is really music at the highest level. It was fantastic. I loved it. And in 1997, when I left the King's Singers, um, I left to follow a career as a composer, but for by default, I kind of stood in for some The first term I did the Brahms Requiem, well, I tell you, that was a learning curve, but I loved working with those students. And it was then I started writing music for children because I, I became involved with various uh, conductors who I met, uh, 
mainly through Jean. I met Barbara Tagg, and then eventually I met Cheryl Dupont. And I tell you, I, I was completely captivated by the world of children's music. And I think, to be honest, in my life, um, the, the music I have written for children and the work I have done with children has... I'm extremely glad to have uh, been a having me here. Um, so I shall pass on now to, the, to our next distinguished colleague. Emily. Same question, number one? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I took a very circuitous path to this wonderful work and felt that I finally arrived at my truest voice by coming to work with young choirs. I started, as Bob did, although not nearly as distinguished a fashion, as a professional singer, had a short, rather neurotic career in that <laughs> realm, and uh, always loved to teach. So I uh, turned to voice faculty work at various colleges and universities while I was still performing and doing theater as well, and loving the combination of combining uh, movement with as many singers as possible. Um, I started a company called Opera for the Young, and s simultaneously uh, renewed my friendship with Doreen Rao, and heard the Glen Ellen Children's Chorus under her tutelage, and was just blown away. And uh, along the way decided that I really wanted to work in community and I really wanted to try to, to enter the conducting field and see if it suited me or if I was, was worthy of that task. And I took to it like a duck to water. I auditioned for the Glen Ellen Children's Chorus after I had done my uh, choral teacher training work with Doreen at, um, at her institute and uh, just took to it like a duck to water. And, and felt I was home for the first time. So I love the performing background that I still very much bring to my work with young people of all ages, whether they're elementary, middle school, high school, or collegiate, and um, just feel very blessed to have found my way to this work. Thanks, Emily. Someone else. Henry, next question. Same question. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you for including me. Well, I have a weird story as well. I was born and raised in northern rural Wisconsin. And so my only connection to music was my mother's stereo. I guess it was mono at that time. And I, of course, I was in the children's choir at the church and I took piano lessons. I think I did my first solo when I was four years old. But when I became the ninth grader, I wanted to get in the band. So I I learned how to play the baritone horn. It's the instrument they handed to me. And I loved the band. I became a drum major. I had band and choir in high school. So I decided I was going to be a band director. And I went to the University of Wisconsin. Um, for a while, I was a music history major because that really intrigued me. But in my freshman year, one of the professors came to me and said, why don't you play a good instrument? And I said, well, I love my baritone horn. What do you mean? He said, well, you love symphonies and you love string quartets and you love opera. How many baritone horns do, do those things? And I said, well, what would be a good instrument? And he said, the cello. I said, really? And he said, yes, if you want, I'll start you on Saturday. And he gave me a three-hour lesson every Saturday from then wow. on. So that spring I was playing Vivaldi sonatas and playing Sanson Cello Concerto by the time I was a senior. So I ended up becoming a music ed major. My first job was in a rural town or a small town in Wisconsin, seventh through 12th grade, general music, all the choirs, in, uh, private uh, string lessons, and the orchestras. And that was chaotic to do all of that. But then in the second year, they built a new high school. So I was high school choir and orchestra. But then I started my master's degree at the University of Colorado. And uh, out-of-state tuition is very high. So I wanted to get a job in Boulder, and there was uh, the head of the, the music area there, Mr. Sagain, said, 
what do you want to do? And I said, I'll do anything, choir, orchestra, or anything. And so he called me in the spring and said, well, we have an orchestra job for you. So for many years, I was the Fairview High School orchestra director in Boulder, Colorado. In fact, if you talk to the people out there now, they, they think I've gone to the other side because I went toward choir. But I always kept singing, and I always loved singing. And eventually, my career led me to Indiana. And in 1986, um, well, actually, prior to that, I was the assistant conductor of the symphonic choir, which is why I came. But in 1986, I got a phone call from the dean saying, would you like to come and teach at Butler University? And I went, I didn't even apply, but I... Um, went there and I started as an adjunct with doing university choir and pretty soon I was teaching conducting pretty soon I was full time and I ended up teaching there 27 years but it was that year in 1986 that I heard the Chicago Children's Choir and it's kind of the same time Emily as you and I I think I met you when you were a voice teacher at CME yeah um, yeah and that's when that whole children's choir thing took off and yeah. so I decided then to start the Indianapolis Children's Choir that was in 1986 and um, I, I continued teaching university level and high school, um, all states, etc. But as you said, Cheryl, we sign up, we get pigeonholed sometimes. And so I've, I've had the children's choir label on my head for quite a while. And finally, Debbie, same question. Well, I think we all have worn many hats as we've gone through this, this wonderful musical life that we all share. Um, I remember joining my church cherub choir when I was six years old. My mom had said, oh, you should go do that. And so one day after Sunday school, I marched down there and popped myself in a chair and joined the choir. Of course, I didn't tell my parents, so they were frantically looking all over the church for me until <laughs> my dad peeked in the door and I said, okay, I'm going to sing now, you know. Um, but my, the church that we belonged to had seven choirs, and so um, I had a very rich upbringing in the choral music tradition. And being from New Jersey, most of our choir directors and, and uh, organists were from Westminster Choir College. So that connection for me, unknowingly for myself, was very, very important. Um, so, you know, of course, I, I did the whole thing of going through high school and taking my music theory classes and singing in the choirs. And I went to college with the idea that I would be a high school music, choral music director, extraordinaire. And um, when I uh, graduated uh, with my undergrad degree, there were very few jobs in, in that time. We were through you know, there was a lot of uh, turnover and a lot of music jobs were not available. And so um, every time I went for an interview for a high school job, they thought I was one of the students. And so that didn't help. <laughs> so I, I was fortunate enough to get a job and it was in, you know, teaching elementary school music, which I didn't really feel like I had a lot of um, proclivity for. I I wasn't sure what I was going to be able to do because I, I was singing semi-professionally and what am I going to do with these young kids? Well, come to be that I just reveled in it. I really, I had two choirs and then I started some auditioned choirs at fourth, fifth and sixth grade level. And um, I really, really enjoyed it. My As a second year teacher, um, ACDA had their bicentennial conference at Interlochen in the summer. And uh, they invited every ACDA chapter to send a quartet to sing in a 200 voice choir in Interlochen. And uh, my husband and I were half of the quartet from New Jersey. So off we went to Interlochen and of course, I'm rubbing elbows with the people I read about in my books, you know, uh, you know, Charles Hurt and all of these people, you know, and uh, it was just wonderful. And every night there were performances while we were rehearsing with Lucas Foss for a, a piece that had been commissioned for the conference. Um, 
I saw the most amazing children's choir with a very pregnant Doreen Rao conducting. <laughs> and I came home to New Jersey. I went to a voice lesson. My voice teacher happened to go to college with Doreen and knew her very well. So I was telling him about this wonderful, wonderful choir director and these amazing children, these young artists. And he said, oh, I know Doreen. And I said, good, I need to know this woman. And so that began my journey through choral music experience and, and all of the wonderful associations and collaborations that have come from learning from Doreen and from so many of my colleagues that were involved with CME and then getting to teach. So, you know, I've I taught 32 years in the public schools and I did finally get to teach middle school and high school. Um, but along the way, I started a children's chorus and I have my children's church choir, which is very, very important to me. And, and now I get to teach choral methods at um, one of our state universities, which also just kind of codifies everything that we all do. Um, it's so wonderful to nitpick and think about all of those things that maybe I just thought I did automatically. Um, but so much fun to talk with my students about it and get them thinking along those lines. So um, I'm just counting on a lot more years of working with young voices. Um, I really miss that right now. I miss it a lot because we're not doing anything at this, at this point in time. So um, to all of you who are working with singers, I'm so, so jealous, but I wish you all well. Thank you, Debbie. Okay, the next question, I'd like Emily to give the first answer. I know that you all work with older choirs as well. Is there a difference in the way that you work with young choirs as opposed to high school, college, or adults? Emily. Well, sure, there's a difference, although I would say not as much as you might expect uh, or someone might expect. The sense of humor has to change. You can't be quite as unfiltered with young children. <laughs> and occasionally I had to learn that the hard way. Uh, starting with college and then moving to children, it was, um, it was a learning curve for me in terms of sense of humor. Um, attention span, I think, is a little different. With young children, I tried very hard to not stay on one piece longer than, say, 15 minutes was kind of the guideline. There are exceptions, of course, all the time, but you want to keep the pacing of a rehearsal with any group, but, but certainly with children whose attention span is a little shorter, especially if they're young, um, elementary age, you want to keep it moving. And finally, repertoire is, of course, has to be age appropriate. And it's not just the music, it's the text. Are, are the singers able to really glom onto the text in a really meaningful way? And I always, with young children, tried to stay away from what I called the rainbow and butterflies syndrome, syndrome of always choosing pieces that were cheerful and sunshine and all of this because children have such rich emotional lives and they're thinking about difficult things and they need an opportunity to express in a healthy way um, or grapple with issues that aren't as, as easy. Um, so, uh, you know, I think I'm thinking of Paul Reed's bird song uh, written by a, a child in a concentration camp in the Holocaust. They loved dealing with things that really allowed them to think about suffering and hardship and difficulties and good versus evil of, of any age, or at least with, say, third graders and up or something. I do not have experience with kindergarten first and second that really means anything. So I'm talking about third third grade and up. But um, I, I always, that said, I always challenge singers of any age to deal with texts and composers that were as broad as possible and as global in perspective as possible. And I know we all do that uh, because the, the world is so full of commonality more than difference. And I think you can start introducing that concept 
quite early and help children understand that children in China have the same wants and needs children in Brazil, children in wherever, Australia, as we do. We want to be safe. We want to be heard. We want to be loved. We want to be respected. Um, and I also think that in terms of excellence, and I'll wind this up so my wonderful colleagues can, can chime in, um, I remember an anecdote of, of when I was brand new to Glen Ellen Children's Course teaching the trip. It was called training choir at the time. We changed it to treble choir, third, fourth, fifth graders mostly. And I remember before one of my first performances saying, you are all uh, nor naturally cute and wonderful people to look at, but do you want to go out there and to be given the response, oh, they're so cute? Or do you want to have the audience say, <laughs> that's a fantastic choir. And of course they wanted the second, if given the choice, of course they did. So if they learn the difference between mediocrity and excellence, they will always choose, even from the youngest age, being a really good choir. I'll shut up and let somebody else chime in. Thanks, Emily. Emily, same question, please. Well, I agree with everything Emily has said. I agree entirely. I had kind of an awkward situation because I was a head of choral music at a university, had university ensembles in the daytime and then children's choirs in the same building at nighttime. So all of those college kids looked at me somewhat suspiciously because they thought I was a children's choir director. Uh -huh. So what I found out is I could be more playful, more creative, more myself at night with the children's choirs. But in the daytime, I had to be very professorial and I had to be a little stricter and a little more um, uh, mature about how, how to find the, the essence of the music. So there was that. But there are also some major differences, and it has to do with vocal range and warm-ups. Uh, I never typically would start the choir, the children's choir on C, uh, a fifth above uh, F on the triple step. And that's in their head voice and come down and work across their break. And... So and but when you have SATB, um, that's sometimes a little bit too high to start a warm up, and so I changed the warm up. And usually we'd start on an A, and we'd do different kinds of vocal pieces. I found that the children were much more playful, much more uninhibited. They were willing to move more to the music, and they have what I liked so much about it is they didn't have a preconceived notion about a lot of music they learned. I could put nearly anything in front of them, and they would enjoy learning it. Whereas the college kids knew who Bach was and knew who Beethoven was or whomever, and they had kind of preconceived notions. I remember one time I took the university choir to an MENC convention in Washington, D.C. So I programmed high school level music. Well, my singers were upset with me because they thought they were singing music that was too easy because it was high school level. So I had to be real cautious about that. But I really agree with Emily. When I start to choose music, as I think is true of many of us, I look first at text. And good texts, up, good texts uplift the soul, and bad text, texts pull it back. And um, the level of sophistication can be the same, but the subject matter sometimes has to be different. Uh, there are certain topics that you don't enter into poetically with young people, and uh, that's not to say they can't be, there isn't depth in their understanding of great poetry, but I had to be a little selective. And... Um, like Emily, I, I stayed away from love poetry and pirate poetry uh, because it was too stereotyped. Um, so all in all, I enjoyed both, but I always looked forward to the evening rehearsals because the children were so reactive to what we did. Thanks, Henry. Debbie, same question. Okay, well, I think we should compile Emily and Henry's comments and start putting something together that we can share in the written word. Um, all of those things are, are, are very much what I think we and those of us who um, we may be talking to uh, think about. Um, in terms of my additions to those ideas, um, I do think the attention span can be quite different. Um, and uh, Emily alluded to it earlier in, in the first question in, in terms of using movement. Um, I also use a lot of visual aids and puppets with younger children. 
Um, even in my general elementary classes, when I would have kindergartners and first graders who were afraid to sing, afraid to make a mistake, they would sing to a puppet and they would feel very, very comfortable with that. Um, and eventually they would sing to the rest of the class. So um, I think that using um, the visuals, using movement, um, and not that you don't do that with the older choirs, because I do. Everywhere I go for guest conducting, I take my Hoberman ball, and it doesn't matter if they're high school. Even my college choral music methods students love, you know, oh, all these great props you have, right? Um, but I think if you if you know your pedagogy, if you know the 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 voice from from age five through age nineteen. You will, you will judge accordingly. You will choose repertoire that is appropriate for the voice and the mind, and as Helen Kemp says, the body and the spirit. Um, I, I really believe that uh, so much of it is the same in teaching, um, but obviously we need to apply it to the age level and the ability and the, and the understanding again, with text, understanding of how to express the text. I'm always amazed at what my youngest singers bring to the table when we start to talk about the meaning of this song or even how we should sing it. Um, it that's, I think that's what floors me the most, brings tears to my eyes. Thanks, Debbie. And finally, Bob, same question, please. Thank you. Well, I agree with everything that everyone has said, um, and uh, but there, there were just a, a few things that I thought of. Um, for me, uh, and certainly it happens in this country, is um, oh shoot. Used, but I. I, I've done this with all the choirs that I've been involved with, to say to a, someone, if they're going to take part in something, you've got to turn up on time. You've got, if you say you're going to do something, you've got to be there. You've got to do it. You've got to approach it like a, 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 a commitment that you make. Now, I was in King's College Choir as a chorister, and we had our job to do. And actually, that was very important, the discipline of doing it. If you were in a sports team and you showed up late, you'd be out. You know, if you didn't do what you had to do, you'd be out. And that should be the same for music. And I liked what Emily said. I've never met a child who doesn't want to do things the very, very best they could. And if you... Um, well, actually, nearly 20 years ago now, I became principal guest conductor of the BBC Singers, which is a professional choir, a very, very fine choir. Um, and uh, I remember I was terrified before the first rehearsal. I thought, well, what am I going to do? How am I going to approach this? And actually, in the end, I thought, I'm going to approach it exactly the same as I would, I would if I was working with a load of kids. Do the best work you can and be yourself, commit yourself to what you're trying to do and make the music as best you can and, um, and react to what you hear that, uh, uh, when they sing. And that, uh, it, it go, it, as far as I'm concerned, it's the same for everyone and uh, I think that's a really Thanks, Bob. Next question, and we're going to start with Henry this time. You've all spoken a lot about. <laughs> go ahead, Bob, please, go ahead. Sorry, did I, oh no. We have a bit of a delay here, so please go ahead. We'd love to hear the end of what you said. Oh, sorry. Um, I think it's very important not to condescend in any way to young people because yeah. they're there doing it and it's very important to respect them and to 
do the absolute best for them. So one final little story, and it's a very short one. I, um, it's about context of um, And Russell said, I really liked your song, she said, but we sang a really cool song the other day by some guy called Vivaldi, she said. Do you know him? <laughs> and I thought that was great. I loved that. I, I think I said to her, yes, I had a cup of coffee. With you. <laughs> it, it was so great. I loved it. Italian coffee. <laughs> Can I add one more thing course, to this question, and, which we haven't mentioned, and that is the teaching of literacy, I think, is really different between children and older singers. Uh, I'm a Kodai teacher, and many of you are, and so we teach do to do major and lot of our minor, and we, it's movable do. But I found a, quite a conflict with the college oh, yeah. music theory oh, professors, yeah. because they were teaching movable do, but they were doing do to do major and do to do minor, and once singers have become more advanced, the whole approach to teaching literacy in the context of music changes. Um, so, so I just wanted to add that because it's pretty different, I think. Of course. Any other comments before we move on? Okay, third question. For Henry starting. We've covered a lot of things uh, that you like about children's choirs and how you work with them, but I wanted to go a little bit more into this. What are your favorite things? about working with young choirs. So Henry, please start. Well, certainly, you know, the adjectives that come to my mind are innocence, vulnerability, uh, acceptance. Uh, you know, when I, when I felt I was successful as a children's choir director is when I could look in their eyes and see their eyes change. And to me, there was much more of a blank palette to work with. Uh, there were no preconceptions, but I don't think anything can move an audience as much as innocent, sincere children singing beautifully. It's an art form that, that we all discovered, um, you know, in the mid 80s or whatever. Um, I, I just think that connecting with kids is so important. And I always felt when I taught middle school kids, those seventh, eighth and ninth graders, that I was changing lives, really changing lives, because they all seemed, first of all, skeptical, but then enormously loyal. And they, they we're trying to decide who they were in themselves. And so it helped me mold them into a direction toward beautiful things, toward poetry, toward uh, a, f a friendly and a wonderful life. And uh, once I got the college students, there was nothing against that. They came with all sorts of those things already resolved. So I think when we work with children, we have a greater ability to affect lives in so many ways. Thanks, Henry. Debbie, same question. I agree with you, Henry. I do think that we have the ability to change lives and help mold these young people into incredible contributing adults. Um, they also change my life. Um, mm -hmm. I am not, I'm a different person every time I walk out of a rehearsal. And quite frankly, many times I'm walking into a rehearsal thoroughly mentally, physically exhausted, and the energy and the joy that those children bring to the rehearsal. You know, after about five minutes, I'm like, oh, I'm not tired at all. I could go for hours working with these wonderful, wonderful human beings. And um, I, think, I think that really, you know, ties it together for me the joy and the energy and the love of music and the love of each other that they bring to every single rehearsal so that the performances are great, a great source of joy because they've done all of that to prepare. And um, it's just a great, it's a great feeling. And I feel so fortunate to be on the receiving end of it. Thank you, Debbie. Same question, Bob. Um, I think as a composer, if I'm thinking primarily as a composer, one of the things that's been so incredible about probably the last 25 years is the growth of repertoire for, for children's choirs. 
and that's got so many so much to do with so many people with Doreen Rao with the way that the that the that the children's choir world has expanded and been much more noticed and realized um, and by great leaders in uh, children's choir music and I I always felt as a composer the biggest challenge was um, They're very on the money with ideas about pieces and concepts about pieces, and they're very open about it. So I love that openness. Um, and I think I learned more about um, access to ideas through working with children because they're so creative and they're so responsive when we become adult, we become much more insecure with our own opinions, and we're 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 more defensive in a sense, um, certainly in groups. And children are much more willing to be open because their life is all about learning. And as my other colleagues have said, you know. children, that has been the greatest privilege of my life because it's a, it's a critical one and also it's a very challenging one. So um, I think there was a concept at one time that writing for children or writing anything like that was something like, you know, well, why would you do that? And to anyone who asks that question, I would say because it's the very best thing you can possibly do. And it's the hardest thing you could possibly do. So um, th that really is all I can say about that. But I think exactly what what uh, uh, Henry and Deb Thank you, Bob. And finally, Emily, on the same question. Well, I don't feel like I have a lot to add here. It's all been beautifully expressed by you wonderful folks whom I so admire. Um, I guess I would like to voice for the sake of class music teachers who are listening that they may be saying, you may be thinking, that may work very well for all of you in auditioned or private community children's choir work, um, but it feels different to me in the classroom. And I would say, um, even though I have no right to say this because I've never been a public school teacher, I have certainly taught public school children in their classrooms when invited to come in and doing outreach work and so forth and so on. What I, the single most important lesson that I've learned as a teacher over the years, and I kind of cringe when I think back to some of my early rehearsals, is how important it is to teach human beings music rather than teaching music to human beings. Um, if, if people of any age, but particularly children, know that you genuinely respect them and care about them. Even if they're not sure they want to be in the room, that's when you can really get them to trust you in any circumstance because everybody needs caring for. And the kids who most push your buttons, I remember reading Eve Ely's book, Ho Hoagie's Journey, how beautifully he brought this home. The children who most push your buttons are the ones who most are craving your care and your love and your TLC. And that's such a hard lesson to learn, but it's so true the older I've gotten and the more I 
the more experiences I've had. So in any circumstance, the more you can care for the human beings in the room, the more they will want to reach a higher level, the more enthusiasm they will bring, the more unfiltered passion they'll have for what you're trying to impact them. And I keep look, forgetting to look at the webcam instead of my colleagues because it's, it's so nice to see their faces. Uh, that That's a lesson that I, I just really... Um, wish I had learned sooner. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And our final question. What would you say to someone who thought that the only job of those who work with elementary and middle school and children's choirs is to pre prepare them to be artists when they become older and sing in high school, college, or adult choirs? Please share your thoughts about this opinion and we'll start with Debbie this time. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, I'd actually like to bounce off what Emily just finished with and it's, um, it's actually a quote of Cheryl Lavender's that we have on our Children's Choir website and it's that the fact that children can make beautiful music is less significant than the fact that music oh, yeah. can make beautiful children. And I think we are so fortunate to make music with children of all ages, even some of those 90 year olds in my husband's community choir. Um, we're so fortunate because music isn't just about making music. It's about making citizens of the world. It's about making compassionate, caring people. And I'm sure we've all experienced it, whether in the public school arena, or the community choir arena, or the church choir arena, or the professional choir arena. We are a community unto ourselves. And just the fact that, that we can share and build each other up and be there when someone is needed to just have a shoulder, you know, padded or whatever, um, we, I always joke about a woman in our church choir, the two of us were pregnant uh, at the same time and delivered our children a month apart from each other. And uh, I have been through carrying my children, she carrying her children, the, the you know, their weddings, their, uh, their grandchildren, the loss of their parents, the loss of one of my parents. We have been through life together. And I, even when it's just a small or a short period of time in a child's life, it's a long period of time. And we, uh, we are so fortunate that we have the ability to learn to understand about each of these young human beings from year to year. Um, that's, that's a great benefit in, in, in public school, but also in our children's choirs as they move through each level of, of singing. Um, it's so wonderful. You become a part of their lives and they become a part of yours. Thank you, Debbie. Same question, Bob. Well, thank you, Debbie. That was a, that was a, a lovely answer. And I, um, I was trying to think what I could add to that. Um, probably not much, but the, the one thing that I know in my life is that um, an artist is an artist of any age, um, and uh, it's just by the act of doing it that you are an artist. Now, um, the majority of, of people who sing as young people will go off into the world and do all sorts of different things. Um, it's a pity we don't have In choir teaches us um, so many things just instinctively um, when it, in the way that one deals with other people and the way that one interacts with other people and the way that you feel about yourself actually um, but in my view too the, the um, 
the standard that you can achieve with young singers is as high as a standard could ever be. Um, uh, the idea that somehow you're preparing a, a child for some future life in music is, is a very strange one to me because um, the, as we all know, the choir is only as good as the mentor. that the desire to um, do something good is very important, both musically and socially. And uh, I think we have to... Uh, I loved what Emily said actually earlier about loving your singers. I, I, I think that is a very important thing to do because we're part of their lives, whether... We like it or not, we are, and we're very important to them in their lives. And so, uh, and, and this continues, it doesn't matter whether you're uh, 10 or you're 80, it just doesn't, it doesn't matter. You have a very, very important function to play. say because um, a lot of the time most of the time we're in absolute agreement about it and we've all had completely different experiences and that is wonderful thank you Bob next, next is Emily same question please well I, I found the question quite odd um, and rather soulless. I'm not criticizing the question because I know it, we need to talk about it, and some people apparently feel this way, but um, to me, wanting to sing in high school and college and, and uh, later in life is, is a byproduct of our doing our work well. I mean, we, if with young singers, we set the scenes, seeds, we sow the seeds, um, of um, loving music as a way of expressing our inner selves. Uh, one, one expression, and I can't credit the, the writer, but I read once that music allows us to bring the soul to the surface. Um, I, I, I love that idea. And if we're doing that with children, that's contagious. You, you want to keep feeling that. So, uh, and then if you're teaching healthy vocal habits so that singing is a physically and emotionally pleasurable experience for the singer. That's something you want to keep doing. Uh, establishing a, a sense of community in an ensemble, which choral singing can do so brilliantly. That's something you want to keep doing. Um, so yes, there are many choices that, that follow a, a young person once they've been in a young choir, but um, hopefully if we're doing our jobs well, this is just a, a byproduct of, of their having been started in the right way, and they want to continue naturally. Thanks, Emily. And Henry, you get the last word. <laughs> How about that? Uh, well, I think the basic question that I hear you asking is, um, when does artistry begin? And I have to do a confession here that I was on a path toward professional music making. And um, I thought that real artistry started once you got out of college or in college or whatever. And I should say that my wife was an elementary vocal music teacher for 34 years. And in our household, I thought she taught children and I taught music. And then I discovered the, the children's choir. And I was astonished, really astonished that little children can be so artistic. I mean, it bowled me over. In fact, some of the most artistic sounds I've ever heard have come from children's choirs. So over the course of time, I actually wrote a textbook called Creating Artistry Through Choral Excellence because that's what we read is all the things that Emily said, but trying to get to the artistry 
level of the music. And I think it's in somewhat the fault of music schools, because if you're a music student, you take music theory and music history and oral skills and uh, methods classes and all these things. And sometimes in the process of teaching the craft, we forget about the, the artistry. I remember one instance when I was in a car in Washington, D.C. There were three conductors, a man from Florida, a woman from Pennsylvania, and me. And the man from Florida was in the front seat, and he said, you know, I tell my students that if you do the craft right through college, then you can become a musician. And the woman in the back seat with me said, I beg to differ. I think an 11-year-old can be very artistic. And I said, I agree wholeheartedly, and I don't think 11 is the beginning year. So that's the way I started my textbook, uh, was talking about how do we develop artistry and when does it begin? And I think the very youngest children can be artistic at a different um, kind of repertoire or uh, medium, but they can be very artistic. And it's our responsibility to nurture that artistry all the way through their music making process. So as Emily suggested, they have the desire to continue. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was our last question. Does anybody have any final comments? Really quick. I, I, I'd love to just throw in the fact that I, I agree with Henry wholeheartedly that there's something a little wrong with our education um, system in this country in that the goal of choral um, college and graduate students seems to universally be SATB high school and above. That's the ultimate goal. And they're not being given an understanding, in my humble opinion, of how rewarding working with younger singers can be from an artistic standpoint. Uh, and we, we have to get beyond that because there's so many opportunities for people to work in this plethora of children's choruses that are out there and the plethora of of school and private and, and public school jobs that have very strong choral programs. So why are we funneling people so much to, well, we're not really a pro in choral music unless we're teaching mixed ensembles at the high school or above level. That, that's just wrong-headed thinking in my view. So needed to be said, needs to be said. May I? Can I just Thanks, go off Emily. that? Anyone else? Um, I, I do yes, agree yes. with you, Emily. So often, some of my colleagues will say, oh, well, I'm, I'm going up to the high school from the middle school. I, I'm going to be teaching up at the high school. And I, I always, you know, talk to them about, what do you mean? Is it up on a hill? What is going on here? But um, I, I think for me, the best thing that ever happened to me was being an elementary school teacher for several years before I started teaching high school. And then I went back to teaching elementary K to six and K to eight uh, schools in, in very different settings, urban as well as super country. I had a school of K to eight of 78 kids in a little green schoolhouse and taught kindergarten music in the uh, Victorian house on the back property of the school. Cool. So I've had all kinds of experiences, but I think that made me have the ability to be a very creative teacher when I did teach SATB. Because, you know, kind of going in reverse to one of our questions, I brought all of that energy and creative ideas to my high school rehearsals. And, and quite often, um, my students had never experienced those kinds of things, asking their opinion on how should we sing this phrase, or why don't we move to this, see what happens, or, you know, getting one of them up to, to do some warm-ups and see how it feels, and all of those kinds of things. And yes, even using props and visual aids as well. Um, I think that um, if we all have great pedagogy and we treat our students, whatever age they are, in a way that excites them, entices them, um, engages them, and gives them ownership of music, um, everybody wins. Mm -hmm. Can I? 
Thanks, Debbie. Bob, anything else to yes. add? Um, I, I think I've heard mm -hmm. each of you use the word love, and Emily uses the word passion. And I'm very worried about what's happening to our kids right now in this pandemic with their cell yeah. phones, their iPads, virtual yeah. learning. There's a lot of discussion and focus right now on social, immersion, uh, social emotional learning. And there's no better place for that, in my opinion, than in the choir. Someday we'll be able to come back together. Some people already are outside. But I think as public school teachers, as educators in Louisiana, your role is now more important than it ever has been because those kids need you and they need each other. And the sooner we can pull them together and give them emotional, social support, the better their human life will be. Uh, I remember seeing on the children's choir, the Indianapolis Children's Choir, virtual learning thing. All these kids were sharing who their, what their pets were at home and how to fix food and, and what they loved most because that's a really big part of choral music is the, the human connection that, that resides between us. So I, I encourage you to stay, the, stay, stay strong and continue loving those kids. Thank you, well, and Bob. All I will say to you, and you. I, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but in about three weeks' time, I am going to start at the school that I teach two days a week at, this girls' school. I'm going to be um, starting uh, working with uh, 60 voices. Um, they're year eight, so in our system, they'll be 12, 13 years old. And I can't wait. <laughs> real singing inside with kids <laughs> and it's going to be tough for them because they would have done it they they are acoustic Okay, thank you, Bob. So this brings us to the end of our session. My deepest thanks to all of you, my wonderful friends and colleagues, for working so hard to find a time when we could all be together across time zones and countries, and for sharing all the wisdom that you bring to our profession. Uh, I personally am so glad to see your faces and I and hear about what you're doing. So thank you for this. Thanks also to Louisiana ACDA for this virtual conference and to Jared Ritchie for handling the technical side of this session. Uh, I hope everyone has enjoyed it, and I know you will enjoy the rest of the, concert, the uh, conference. Thank you.